This is the giant moving bed filter I built for my koi pond. I think the name is fitting, not just because of the size of the thing, but because, well, it's gray. Moving bed filters are great at processing ammonia, and yet despite holding 6 cubic feet of K1 and K3 media, Big Gray has not been keeping up with the ammonia load in my pond. This is another 6 cubic feet of K2 media. But Ty, I hear you ask, why K2 media? Why not K3 or K1? Because this is the most cost-effective stuff I could find. Now, I know my moving bed looks like it's pretty full of media, but it is actually pretty darn sparse in there. As you can see, once I turn the aeration off, the media only takes up maybe a quarter of the total water volume. But now that I've had it up and running for almost a year, I've noticed there are some issues that really need some improvement. For example, but one of the biggest problems with this filter has been the return. Now, initially, I thought this was a good idea, but the problem is this shape is so bulky, it makes it difficult to have a good flow as the bubbles push the media up and then gravity helps take it back down and the flow of the water, this just causes too many issues. The other problem is that K1 media can work its way through these grooves if it hits it just right. But we'll circle back to that later. After sanitizing and drying all the new media in the sun, I decided to just add it all in. A few boxes later, I could not believe how much media was in this filter. It's pretty obvious which media is new because it's all snow white. You know, it kind of looks like fancy pasta, but I want it to look like forbidden pasta. You know you've developed a healthy layer of beneficial bacteria when it doesn't look white anymore. For a while now, I've noticed that the flow inside of Big Gray just has not been working the way it should. There are two huge air stones inside of the filter that push the air up and make all of the media move and tumble about. But one of them stopped firing a little while back. And I finally figured out why. As it turns out, this manifold right here has failed. I took the clamps off earlier when I was playing around with this, but when I removed this airline right here, I have plenty of air pushing through that one. But this one... There's nothing, there's no air coming through here, and this is wide open. Whoa! It's a tiny bit of air. It's a tiny bit of air that's coming through there. So, I need to replace this whole assembly right here. This is not working. So, I got myself a replacement that I don't think is going to get clogged or fail like the last one did. I just gotta get it put together. Now that we got the new one assembled, all we have to do is stick it on. Stick it on. Well, I guess that edit only works once per video. It's not pretty, but it'll work. So the assembly I had before for the returns inside of the moving bed filter is just too bulky and it doesn't work. And the biggest issue I found are these right here. I thought these were gonna work well for what I needed. The problem is that the K1 media will actually get through these little slots right here, but I think I've come up with a solution that'll work. Rather than get something else for the water to be able to return through, I decided to take the one I had, and we're actually just gonna take some zip ties and weave it through the slots. I think by doing that, we'll actually be able to close that gap enough that the K1 media won't be able to travel through these slots anymore. Now just to clean this thing up done. Before fitting this back onto the return pipe, I did my best to shove a piece of K1 media back through the slots and there was nowhere for it to fit. I'd say the zip ties were a success. Now that we've added the new media, fixed the return, and fixed the airflow, all that's left is crossing our fingers and firing her up.
I'm pretty impressed with how well these adjustments have worked. There is now no dead space inside of the filter where the media gets built up in the corners or anything like that. Now something that's kind of cracking me up is that Big Gray is nowhere near full. We could easily fit another 12 cubic feet of media in there, but do I need to? That's the big question. And I don't think I do. But to explain why we gotta get into the science of how these filters work versus other types of biological filters. There's primarily three different types of filters you can do for biological filtration in a pond. The first being submerged media. This can be sponges, canister filters, bog filters, or wetland filters, whatever you want to call them. And that's where the media is actually submerged in the water the entire time. There's no air contact at all. The second time is a shower or trickle tower where the water rains down from above through the media. So water and oxygen are both interplaying there. The last one is a moving bed filter where there is air actually being pumped into the water. One, to move the media around, but two, to create an oxygen rich environment. There's two factors that affect how effective a biological filter is. The first is how much media there is for the bacteria to grow on. And the second one is how much oxygen is available in that environment. A submerged filter is going to use that oxygen much faster because there's no new oxygen being introduced to the environment. The bacteria is gonna use that to help them process the ammonia and nitrites. A shower filter is going to be much more effective because there is literally oxygen being mixed in with the water as it trickles down through the media. And then a moving bed is going to be the most effective because there is oxygen being pumped into the water. So why did I make Big Gray so big? Why is it so massive? The easy answer is this is America. Why would we build things small? But the answer is actually a little bit more involved than that. When did you start it, Ty? Huh? When did you start the pond? I feel like it was 2021, technically. I put a lot of thought into building my pond. One thing I knew from the beginning that I wanted was for it to be fiberglass. My pond is kind of a funky shape, and so when I ordered all the materials to fiberglass it, I didn't know exactly how much I needed. So I ordered a lot more material than I actually ended up using. But coincidentally, this worked out really great because I knew I wanted a moving bed and I figured fiberglass was the best material to make it out of. All I needed was some plywood and I could build a waterproof box to whatever dimensions I wanted. I added a window just because I thought it'd be really neat to be able to see the media moving around. Originally my plan was to have Big Gray be a lot bigger than it currently is, but I had to be able to fit it through the door. Ever since I first got Big Gray up and running, I've been a little disappointed with the performance. So getting it to this point is actually pretty significant for my koi pond. But that still doesn't explain why this filter's so big. I thought a visual demonstration might help better explain the reason I need such an efficient biological filter for my pond. And a stein glass is the best thing I can use to show that. It was also the closest thing I had on hand. This is how much food my auto feeder does per feeding, but it does this multiple times a day. So by the end of the day, there's about a stein glass worth of food in my koi pond. This isn't even factoring in that I hand feed my fish every day when I get home from work. The reason I feed my fish so frequently and so heavily is because I'm looking to grow big fish. But a byproduct of that is a lot of ammonia load in the pond. That's the reason I want to have an efficient biological filter for all of that. I'm also factoring in that my fish are going to get bigger and require more food as they grow. Not to mention, I'm also going to be getting more fish as time goes on. So having an oversized filter, I don't think is ever going to be a negative. I don't see any downsides to it. Other kinds of filters work great too, but it really just comes down to the efficiency for me. But speaking of feeding my fish a lot of food, but regardless of how much you feed your fish, you're not gonna get the same growth potential if you're not feeding them a quality koi food. And that's the reason I ended up switching to Tomi Guy. But let me explain really quick that I paid my own money for this. This is not a sponsored thing. Nobody gave this to me and told me what to say. This is my honest opinion. So I'm gonna say whatever I want. And the truth is, this food's been really great. So this is Tomi Guy's wheat germ diet. 
And this stuff is 50% protein. I've never heard of a wheat germ that was 50% protein. And to clarify, that protein isn't coming from like poultry meal or from some sort of like high protein vegetable meal or something like that. This is coming from white fish meal, fish meal, wheat germ meal, shrimp meal, a bunch of different vitamins, some other ingredients. But this stuff's really great. And this is a high grade white fish meal. None of that bottom shelf stuff. And I think one of my favorite things about this stuff is that it's made right here in the US. There's a lot of reasons I like that, but one of the biggest ones is, I mean, we got a bunch of crazy tariffs and stuff right now on imported things. So the fact that I can get a high quality koi food that's made here in the US and didn't have to be shipped over from Japan or Germany or somewhere else, I mean, you gotta love it. Saving money. So because I've been enjoying this food so much and seeing the difference it's been making in my tosai and their growth and development, I am done with my old koi food. This is what I'm going to be using from now on. So if you like the video, please consider subscribing. And if you want to see some more stuff about Big Gray when I actually installed it and put it together, that video should be right here. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you later. Bye.